out of the book of Romans chapter 12 beginning in verse 1 says this therefore I urge you brothers and sisters we can put sisters in there too in view of God's mercy offer your bodies as a living sacrifice is holy and pleasing to God this is your spiritual act of worship do not conform any longer to this pattern of the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good pleasing and perfect will for by the grace given me I say to every one of you do not think of yourself more highly than you ought but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function so in Christ we who are many form one body each member belongs to the others we have different gifts according to the grace given us if a man's gift is prophesying let him use it in proportion to his faith if it is serving let him serve if it is teaching let him teach if it is encouraging let him encourage if it is contributing to the needs of others let him give generously if it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. I think today is going to be my anti-sports message. You know, I, I, that, and that hurts me because I'm, ever since I could walk, sports was a big thing for me. You know, whether I was plopped in front of the electric babysitter, the, the television, a.k.a. television, to, you know, watch sports or to take the ball and go out and throw it against the barn and catch it and throw it again repeatedly until there's a hole in the wall, that sort of thing. So, but there's a lot of good things that happen in sports in, in America, but there's a lot of negativity, too. And the big ne negativity is... We are competing against one another. There's, there's a sense of competition. We have to beat the other person or the team. But that runs that message, really, and that's ingrained in Americans for the most part, competition. And that's not just in sports. It could be in business or something like that. Or even, even churches can sometimes get in this idea of competition. Oh, look at they. They've got 1,200 people. We've got 12, and they got 1,200. But this message here, and, so, and forgive me if I get, off my, I get off script here a little bit, but this idea of my sermon today is about how God's gift restores us. And we, we are restored because we, we are on the same team. And we, we're... We're given some same things, but in a sense, different amounts. And, and this message comes up basically from uh, really the men's group. We were discussing this on Wednesday, and, and I had this, you know, I was going to do this sermon of Psalm 52, but I'll wait, I'll wait for another day on that one. But my question is today, if you were God, and if it was your will that your people be strong in faith, and that's what God wants, God wants people who are strong in his faith because remember Peter and came out of the boat and he says oh you of little faith why you know why why you know why didn't you believe because you were sinking Jesus said that too but if you had if you were God and you had the right and the power to give the gift of faith which all of us need as Christians and you could give it in whatever proportion you could give it so that everyone, we could all be catapulted into perfect love and perfect faith. And wouldn't, wouldn't we want to do that as God? Well, that's just another reason why we're not. God has a greater plan for us when he gives people faith at different levels. Some get more. Some. Did you ever say to yourself, oh, I wish I had faith like that person has. See, that person really has a strong faith. And my faith is so weak. I remember once I took a, uh, a spiritual gift survey back in seminary many years ago. I'm, maybe it's changed. But I remember all these gifts were listed. Do you know what my last gift on that? It was faith. A lot of other good gifts, but that one came in last. But God didn't give us all the same amount, did he? He, he didn't give everyone great faith. He didn't give everyone great gifts. And we just can't say, well, 
it's our independent, our independent wills, and God can't change that. And God can change that in us. So we can't just say, well, you know, that's the, it's because we all have different wills. And the text makes it very clear that God has the right, he has the ability to give different levels of faith that pleases him. He gives different degrees of grace, which pleases him, and he gives different kinds of gifts. <clears throat> And the reason, or part of the reason why he does this, I'll get into this in more detail here, is that it's about how do we glorify God corporately rather than individually. And that's why I said at the beginning here, it's kind of my anti-sports message because I don't know about you, but if you watch sports lately, and there's a lot of pounding on the chest that goes on, individuals. And that really drives me nuts. Because really, when you think about it, you know, the joke in our family is, there's no I in team. Yes, but there is a me. There is me in team. But we read in this, this focus here on, in Romans chapter 12 that we need to have sound judgment about the, um, the gifts we have been given. We need to have sound judgment about the grace we have been given. And that's important because Right at the beginning of Romans chapter 12, it talks about be renewed by the transforming of your mind. So that's about thinking. God wants us to think soundly and soberly. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself in sober judgment, in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. I don't know, maybe today you think God has given you great faith. Raise your hand. Do you feel like you have great faith? We have one, my wife. She has to have great faith because she, she, got, she uh, married me, so there you go. But we've got a few people out there. They're not, not really bold. You're not really bold and go, oh, you know, if you had great faith, wouldn't you put both hands up? No, I mean, oh, maybe, Pastor, maybe I got great faith. I don't know. I guess I'd have little faith. I don't know. But you know what? Whatever faith you have, God gave you that faith. It is a gift. But Paul is concerned here in Romans chapter 12 about the way we think. How, did you, what are, how were you thinking this morning when you woke up this morning? I admit that sometimes when I wake up, the first thing out of my mouth is, praise God another day. That's not, that's not sometimes how I think. I should think that way. But Paul says, be renewed in your mind. The aim of this renewed mind, this renewed mind, this right thinking, this sober judgment, is that somehow that we could take the gifts God has given us, take the faith God has given us, take the grace God has given us, and use it for the sake of the body of Christ. The aim is love. That's what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Love must be sincere. That's what he writes, right, after this kind of a summary statement, after he talks about, if you have the gift of prophecy, do it. If you have the gift of generosity, use that and give generously. If you give the gift of encouragement or service. So I want to focus on this, is this, this, judge, this sober judgment we need to have, based, it's from a renewed mind, that can only be... If, to have a renewed mind has, has to do with God living in you and working from your, the inside out about the, the transformation of who you are as a person. You can't have a renewed mind if you're not a Christian. Then you think, if you're not a Christian, you think worldly. You have a, you have a mind that is corrupted by the world. So one of the questions I ask you is to, when you think about the goal of this message, or my message is, I wanted to help discover what the, what, the, what the meaning of the church is. And I remember being back here five years ago, really when I started here, my, my goal was, I tried to lay out, and that's a little long time, I don't even remember what my message is now, I'm sure you don't. If I don't remember them, how are you going to remember them? But um, the, what is the meaning of the church? Is the church mainly a place where we come and we sit down and listen to, a, to a, someone, you know, blow off some steam for a half hour? 
Or is the church mainly a place where we come and we meet and we minister to one another by the power of the Holy Spirit? And and that's just not on Sunday. The church has that power throughout the week to meet together and to minister to one another. I'm so happy when I come in here on a Tuesday morning and there's a prayer meeting going on and maybe Julie, Julie and the ladies are in there. They're studying the scripture together and Maybe the, the, the couple of trustees are, are in there counting the money and trying to get that all organized and whatever else has, what other else ho- housekeeping uh, responsibilities there are for the church. But that goes on throughout the week. <clears throat> so, yes, it's a come and hear, but it's also a meet and minister place. And every member is growing in their ability to minister. We have unique grace given to us, and we, and we, we give that to others, to the body of Christ. We have a unique opportunity to witness to those outside the church because of our gifts and the grace given to us. We have a unique opportunity to pay tribute to God in, in, in the form of whether it's giving or, or singing or, le- or, or preaching, whatever. But we got to have sound and sober judgment in this. And so what is this? What is, this, what is the essence of what uh, Paul's talking about here? Well, first of all, the sound judgment is opposite of pride. <coughs> opposite of pride. Again, I'm going back to my anti-sports message, okay? And let, like, again, this hurts me because this is, this is, what, this is my wheelhouse. It's what, when I was, well, 40 years ago, okay, when I was 18. Now I'm, you know, way beyond my, way beyond that now. But see, when we, when we, when we do sports or when we try to, to achieve certain athletic prowess, I guess you'd say, well... What are we doing? We're trying, to, we're trying to glorify ourselves in a sense. But that's pride. And I'm not saying that's necessarily all wrong. It's good to I try to attain certain, you know, things like that. But a sound judgment, a sober judgment, is the awareness that our grace and our faith and, and the gifts that God gives us is exactly that. They're gifts. We didn't deserve them. They are free. And so there's no ground for boasting. There's no ground for pounding your chest and pointing into the stands and kissing the crowd and saying, oh, look at me. It's about unifying, bringing together, unifying the church. Sound judgment means a perspective based on God's gracious freedom and our our humility. And so he sets that example first by the way he talks to the Romans, but he says, you know what? It is by, by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, he says, not because of who I am, not because I'm an apostle, not because, you know, I, I, I'm, uh, you know, done a lot of studies and do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. For by the grace given me, I speak to you. Paul does not presume to speak from his own authority. He is the messenger. The special grace given me, I say to you. His boldness to, the, to, to tell the church what he thinks and what they ought to do is not owing to anything of him by his nature or by his doing. It's owing to a special grace God gave him. Christ had freely called Paul and freely graced him to do what Christ wanted him to do. So he says, grace given me, and then right away after that he goes, the grace given you. Verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. I speak through the grace given me, but our gifts differ according to the grace given to us. 
So, the first characteristic of a re renewed mind as we Christians need to have. It is permeated with the understanding, with the awareness that whatever God calls us to do, it will be based on the grace he has given us to do it. And that should give us a peace of mind, shouldn't it? If we have been given grace, that should give us a real a peace of mind. Because it says, God is for us. He's not against us. God is giving us something that's going to help us in this life and the next. He's not abandoning us. We can rest in God's goodness. We can, we can find purpose in God's grace. It gives us a peace of mind. And the second effect of grace is that, well, we talked about humility. It gives us a peace of mind. It gives us humility. I did not earn this. Did not deserve this. This is what grace is all about. It is by grace. It is no longer by works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. So thinking with sound judgment means you th your thinking is permeated with this awareness. You have a role to play because of grace, not merit. It's going to cause humility in our lives. And third, and this is very important, it gives us power. It gives us peace of mind, it causes us to be humble, and, it, and grace gives us power. Grace is not mere permission to serve, like, oh, yeah, I give you the grace, now you can uh, do whatever. No. It's not mere obligation to serve, like, well, God gave me grace, so I have to do this. It's not mere calling to serve, it's more than that, it's the power to serve. And I think when I go on Monday, tomorrow is our last, our last session of SALT with those kids. And that they, they really tug on my heartstrings after a while when you get to know them. I don't get to know them all personally, but a few of them I do. But I really sense the power of being able to share the gospel with them. And I'm sure Llewellyn feels it and Shirley and others who are involved there. But to be able to go and to these young minds and to have them see that inquisitive look on their face and then you tell them, you try to explain to them again in a different angle what it means to be a Christian, how to become a Christian and it's like, oh, okay, I'm starting to get it. Because it takes a while. It doesn't happen in one, one session. It takes ten sessions and that's why we have at least ten sessions. So we get to do this over and over again and, and, and maybe it's going to stick. If I had more faith, maybe, they would, maybe it would more, but I don't know. But, but I'm really excited about that. But the power to serve. I cannot do that on my own strength. You know, I come up with ideas, or I come up with a game, and things like that. I don't do that on my own strength. It's just like when I stand up here, I don't, I don't do this on my own strength. If I did, I'd be wilting and laying on a cot somewhere here in the back. So Paul, first of all, he sets an example of humble thinking. First, you know, he shows, this is, you know, I'm thinking humbly. I want you to think humbly, he says. And so he says, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. I'm going to... Forgive me if I go off script here a little bit. So the first way Paul shows us about is by telling us that he and we will fulfill our role in the church, again, only by the grace that God gives us. Second, and this is what came up in the men's group the other night, or I think uh, John Boholsky brought this up, but um, what, what's this idea about different measures of faith? He says that he give different, God gives different measures of faith owing to the measurement that God gives. And that sounds almost confusing there, doesn't it? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, What do you have that you did not receive as a gift? And if you received it, why do you boast as if it were not a gift? So, 
So we get different measures of faith. We get different measures of gifts. And it goes back to this idea where it's not in competition. We're not contestants in a game here. We're all on the same team as Christians. The point in all this is that our differing gifts and our differing grace and our differing faith are supposed to be understood not as differences as contestants in a game. We're not trying to beat each other, but we're trying to serve each other. The grace we get, the faith we get, they're never grounds for self-exaltation, but only God-exaltation. So I go back to, to, the, to the, my original question here. Since God has the ability and the right to give us all the same great faith and all the same grace and the same gifts, why does he give such a variety of measures of this? Well, I believe the answer rests in that God intends to create and perfect a people for himself, not ready-made like popping you into the microwave and cooking you for two minutes, but rather so that those who have more gifts or more faith can serve those who have less. And that we can join God in the process of helping each other grow in the knowledge and the faith and the hope and the love of God. Remember what Paul describes? He says this about the Corinthian Christians. He says this about himself. He's saying it about us. He says, we are co-laborers with Christ. We are fellow workers Perhaps it's like restoring an old car. Who's, I know there's a couple of people in here um, that have done that in the past. The Davises. The Davises, did they have an old car? I mean, Paul Davis, I think I, I actually bumped into him not too long ago, he and his wife. And, and I suppose if I were wealthy, I could go online and buy a nice restored car, and so I'm going to put all, had done it and made it even better than new. I could do that, but I had to be quite wealthy to do something like that. And for a large sum of money, I could buy that and drive it around in all the fancy parades and uh, en enjoy people looking at me and say, wow, what an awesome antique car you have, all restored. But would that be nearly as satisfying as if I had taken that car apart and, and, and cleaned all the different parts of it and put it back together again and tightened every nut and bolt and that would be a real labor of love, wouldn't it? But it wouldn't happen very fast. Would I? I mean, it would probably take, it could take decades to do something like that. Especially if you had a job and you had to, you know, only could do it in your spare time. The result would go much slower and everything would be done personally and you would inspect and clean and polish every part. But if you did it that way, wouldn't uh, it be even worth more, it'd be more valuable than you would never want it? It'd be priceless then. You wouldn't want to sell. Somebody's, I'll give you 25, 30,000 for it. Oh, no, it's, it's worth more to me than that because I know every intimate detail of that car inside and out. And I don't even know. I'm sure people can tell me all sorts of different parts of a car that I have no clue to, but... But the bottom line is, God gives some more. He gives some less. Not so that we'd all move along, all straight ahead on some assembly line, cookie cutter sort of thing where we all come out and, you know, some people get worried about that. Well, I have to be coming to the image of Christ. What if I don't want to be in the image of the Lord? I mean, he wasn't, I mean, was he a good basketball player? I don't even know. He's, God is not wants to put us into some cookie cutter sort of thing. But he wants those who have more gifts and more faith and 
to serve those who are of less right now. And, so the, and, and those who have less right now would grow till they have more. And then they could serve others who have less. And I think this is the way God is about trying to restore his church, restore us in a way that will bring him honor and glory in a more satisfying way. There you go. There's my anti-sports uh, message for the day. Now you can go home and watch March Madness or whatever you're going to do this afternoon. I don't know. But there is a lot of madness out there. And so we need, we need to think soberly and sound judgment.